Welcome into episode 13 of the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. Today, my guest is Jamie Chanter, and we'll be talking about makerspaces, formative assessment tools, brain pop, edu protocols, and quizzes. Let's rock! Hi, I'm Amber Harper, host of the Burned In Teacher Podcast, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the podcast you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual hosts. Be sure to check out our other podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com and get ready because the learning begins in three, two, one. Welcome to the Educational Duct Tape Podcast with Jake Miller. Yo, happy Vernal Equinox, everyone. You say Vernal Equinox or Equinox? Happy Vernal Equinox, everyone. I don't know what to say. (laughs) This episode drops on the Vernal Equinox or Equinox, otherwise known here in the States as the first day of spring. I am so happy for spring to be here. We've had a cold winter and the thought of sunshine, blue skies, baseball games, and cookouts makes me so happy. (laughs) On the topic of things that make me happy, how about the duct tapers? Having such an engaged, supportive group of motivated and passionate educators as listeners is a blast. I've loved hearing from all of you on Twitter through the Apple Podcast Reviews and on the Educational Duct Tape Flipgrid. As always, at the end of the show, I'll share some duct taper content from each of those venues. Since we've got such a motivated group of listeners, I wanted to present a little opportunity to y'all. Some of you have asked for Educational Duct Tape stickers, and I'd love to give them to you. If I was going to bump into you at an upcoming conference, I'd gladly give you a sticker, but that's just not likely for all of you, so I've got a two-part idea for you. If you're going to an upcoming conference or ed camp and would be up for being the de facto duct taper rep at that conference, I would love to send you a handful of educational duct tape stickers to pass out to other duct tapers at the event. And of course, you can keep a few for yourself. So in the show notes, there is a link to a form that you could fill out to request some stickers be sent your way. You can also access that form at jakemiller.net slash send me stickers. Some of you are like, hey, Jake, wait a minute. What if I'm not going to a conference? How can I get a podcast sticker? (laughs) Well, I've got you covered too, Elmer Fudd. (laughs) At that same address, jakemiller.net slash send me stickers. What was that address, Elmer? jakemiller.net slash send me (laughs) stickers. You can get... (laughs) What's wrong with me? (laughs) At that same address, you can get the (laughs) address... Oh, goodness. At that same web address, you can get the mailing address to my P.O. box so that you could send me a self-addressed, self-stamped envelope, which I will then put a put a sticker in and send back your way. If you know a few duct tapers, just put that on a note in the envelope and I'll throw in however many you need. I'm happy to send out stickers free of charge for anyone willing to represent hashtag EDU duct tape. It just helps me out if I don't have to pay for postage, print mailing labels and such. Of course, a third option is to buy some of my gift stickers at jakemiller.net slash shop. That's jakemiller.net slash shop. (laughs) Somebody get this guy out of my basement. (laughs) And I always throw a podcast sticker in with those orders so if you order some of those stickers you'll automatically get a (laughs) goodness a podcast sticker along with it anyhow whichever route you choose i really appreciate your support and if you don't choose to do any of those and if you're like jake i don't like stickers just stop talking about stickers i still appreciate you listening thanks for being along on this ride I'm trying to be serious now. Up next, in the next few days, I hope to launch registration for the first GIF a day learning opportunity. It focuses on Google Sheets, and I've already made a few of those GIFs, which I am super proud of. I was kind of geeking out as I was making them. Just to reiterate what GIF a day is, those of you who register will get a GIF and an email to you each weekday during the program. Each of those GIFs will level you up one skill at a time to being a Google Sheets ninja. You can sign up at jakemiller.net slash GIF a day. Day. If you visit that link on the day that this episode launches, there will be a sign up there to get an email when registration opens up. If you're listening a few days late, you may actually find the option to register at that site by the time you go there. Again, jakemiller.net slash gif a day. I'd love to have you along as I try this out for the first time. I'm hoping to actually start sending out those emails in mid-April and to have registration open for the last week of March and the first few weeks of April. We'll see what timetable I could pull off. i got to make the gift. You know. Okay, before I step up on my soapbox, I want to tie a bow on last week's episode where we talked about ways to take notes or remember ideas that we have while listening to podcasts. 
When I went back and listened to the episode, I was very proud of what myself and the duct tapers who pitched in shared, but I realized that I had neglected to answer part of Alex's question. One thing that he noted was that he loved how the tool Video Notes, that's video N-O-T.es, allows him or his students to take notes on a YouTube video that are associated with that precise time in the video. If you've never tried out that tool, you should check it out. He was wishing that there was a similar tool for podcasts. First off, I love that idea, but at least as far as I know, it just doesn't exist. But I do have two ideas here, Alex, that I should have shared last week. I didn't. They they came to me as I was re-listening to last week's episode. Idea one, each of my podcasts also goes up on my YouTube channel. It's, you can find that at Jake Miller Tech. There's no actual video. There's nothing to see there. There's just the cover art and the podcast playing. Uh, but you certainly could use video notes or video not.es with that video. So you would just go to my YouTube channel, copy the URL to that week's uh, podcast episode, jump over to video not.es, paste in that YouTube URL, and then take notes as you're watching. But I'm guessing that most podcast listeners aren't using that strategy. But regardless, that's one option that Alex has and that the rest of you duct tapers have. Another If you need to have your notes synced with a certain spot in the podcast in case you need to go back and listen, some podcast players let you share links to that episode at specific times in the episode. Not all podcast players, but some do. For example, I use Overcast, which I I love Overcast. It's It's just the perfect podcast Uh, catcher and player app for me it just works the way my mind works i guess anyhow in overcast i can click the share o that's my name for that little share icon and then select share at current time and then send that link to google keep or wakelet or just copy it and paste it wherever i want to keep my notes another option if your player doesn't do that would be to just take a screenshot to save in google keep or wakelet or again wherever your notes are to associate with your actual type notes On that note, maybe that's the solution for some of you. Don't take a voice note. Don't set a reminder. Just take a quick screenshot at the time that you want to go back to. Then when you go back to re-listen, you'll know what spots to go back to. Whew, there are a lot of options. I hope this discussion last week and this week has helped you all come up with something that works for you. Ultimately, what matters is that you enjoy yourself while you're listening to these podcasts, you get some ideas, and that they, in the end, benefit some students in some classes somewhere. So if you have some way of taking the ideas that you have and getting them into your practice, that's all that really matters. There's no one right way, and that's educational duct tape right right there. There's, there's not always one right way, and there shouldn't be. And if you come across, I'm going to rant here for a second, if you come across an educational technology person who tries to tell you the right way to do everything, they're, they're wrong. There's not one right way. There's ways that work for you and your class and your students, and the same goes for taking notes to podcasts. Whatever works best for you. And so I just wanted to present a whole bunch of different options to you guys, and hopefully you found one that works for you. And if you think of one that I didn't share, please let me know. We could throw it into a future episode oh sorry hold on let me just grab my soapbox from over here there we go that's perfect climb up on there is this thing on testing testing is it can you hear me hear me oh hot mic oh okay good sounds like we're good okay here we go (laughs) Uh, so I was listening to the Google Teacher Tribe podcast actually today. It's one of my favorite podcasts. And the guest co-host in this particular episode was Lisa Brunnen, who I know from on Twitter. And she was along on the show with the usual Matt Miller. Casey Bell was out on this particular occasion. So Lisa was kind of filling in for her as a guest and a co-host. And at one point in the show, they started talking about how they like to think of tech tools as what their capability is, not what their intended use is. So in other words, when you look at Google Slides, you don't think, oh, this is a presentation tool. You think, oh, I can use this for presentations or for uh, collaborative activities or for stop motion slides or for creating GIFs or for organizing notes or whatever. You think about what the capability of the tool is, not just what the intention of the tool is. And during that discussion, which was a really fascinating one, I recommend you listen to it. It was episode 79, I believe, of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast uh, with Matt Miller and typically Casey Bell. This one's Lisa Brunnen. But 
as they were talking about that and they, talking about how they experience new ideas about the capability of tools by hearing about what other people are doing with them, I started thinking about the adjacent possible theory, which we talked about on this very show a couple weeks ago when Matt Miller himself was the guest. Uh, and I talked about Stuart Kaufman and Stephen Johnson's theories of adjacent possible theory and how ideas spread by being exposed to other ideas. So you can't possibly start using Google Slides for stop motion slides until you first use them just to make maybe a presentation or do something basic in them. And then as soon as you're exposed to that one new step, you see other new steps pop out in front of you that you possibly could take and new paths to explore. One thing I didn't really discuss there was the way that when we see other people do things and we hear from other people, our possible or our adjacent possible ideas expand through those people. And just as I was thinking about that in my car, I was thinking, ah, this is the adjacent possible. Lissa actually mentioned hearing me talk about that in the show, which was super trippy for me to hear that. So Lissa, thank you for that. But that is perfect. And so that's what we're going to talk about here just for a moment on this soapbox is how the best thing you could do to grow as an educator is to put yourself around other people who are willing to share. And the best thing that you could do for other educators is to share. And that could be a lot of different things. That could be telling the people that you work with the thing that you tried out in your class that went awesome or the thing that you tried out in your class that went not so good and asking them, hey, what did you do in your class today? Or, hey, I heard the kids talking about an activity in class today that they really enjoyed. What was it that you did? Or, hey, I heard some laughing and cheering in your class. What were you doing? Because while maybe that exact activity they did might not work in your class, who knows? Maybe they teach a totally different content area. It might spark an idea in your head because you've opened up that new adjacent possible, which then expands into further new adjacent possibles. So that's within your own hallway or building or school community, there are other places to do that. We're coming up on conference and ed camp season when most of them tend to be happening in the spring and summer. That's a perfect chance to get out there and hear other people's ideas. And the sessions you go to are great places to hear ideas, but also so are the hallways and the cafeterias and the coffee tables at these events Talk to people, hear about what they're doing, tell them about what you're doing. Maybe they'll then share something that sparks an idea for you, and maybe you'll spark an idea for, for them. My favorite part is when me and a guest both come at a, a question with two different ideas, and then each of our ideas, we kind of go, oh, then you could do this. Those are the most fun conversations for somebody who's truly passionate about education. When you start to see ideas manifest and multiply and spread and web out and branch out into new awesome things that you could do with students, and it gets super exciting to do that, and conferences are the perfect place for that. And you know, a person like myself who, I wouldn't say I'm the best educational technology expert out there, I mean, I don't know everything, but I tend to go to conferences and think like, yeah, I know 90% of the stuff that's being shared at this conference, but still, if I go and see a rockin' presentation from somebody on a tool that I'm familiar with, I still... I'm bound to have new ideas for how I could use that tool with students just by exposing myself to the adjacent possible of the people in the room. And finally, the very best place to do the adjacent possible theory is Twitter. I love Twitter. And if you're Pinterest or Facebook or anything like that, that's wonderful too. But Twitter for me, I just love seeing what people share. Today, for example, I got tagged in a tweet by former educational duct tape guest Sean Fahey, who was responding to somebody about different ways to use Flipgrid in the mathematics classroom. And he tagged a whole bunch of us to say, hey, what ideas do you have for Flipgrid in the math classroom? And we all started saying our ideas ideas and sharing other people's ideas who then shared their ideas. And hey, I saw so and so talk about this. And it really like there were just so many really cool ideas about how to use Flipgrid in the math classroom. And then I started thinking, oh, this isn't just for math, this could be using these other ones. And the more and more we expose ourselves to those things, the more and more ideas we're going to have. So even as we get to these months of the school year, where we start to get tired and exhausted and look forward to summer, keep putting yourself in situations, whether it's on Twitter, at professional developments, or in your hallways or lounges and within your school, where you're talking to people and sharing your ideas and your experiences and exposing yourself to the possible sparks that you could get from them. And now, speaking of possible sparks, let's hear from an awesome guest. Today's guest. 
All right, today's guest is Jamie Chanter. Jamie is a curriculum and technology teacher for Lakewood City Schools. She is a certified Google educator, trainer, and innovator. She opened and runs the Ranger Hub, the makerspace at Lakewood High School. She also founded Lakewood Future Club for their elementary students. Jamie and her husband have six children. That's not a typo or, or a misread by me. Six children, and all six of them, and Jamie and her husband, all love technology. You can follow Jamie on Twitter at jchanter22. That's J-C-H-A-N-T-E-R-22. Welcome in, Jamie. Thank you, Jake. And I, I just have to correct you really quickly. My husband, he is not a tech lover. I wish he was. Oh, I'm always trying to goodness. push him. I know, but he's one of those, you know, tech is ruining the world kind of guys. Although oh, he spends goodness. a considerable amount of time on Twitter. So I think, I think he's, you know, just trying to get under my skin. He's just trying to be cool. It's like a hipster thing for uh-huh. him, right? He actually yes. lo- he secretly loves it, and he's telling everybody, like, man, technology's the worst. Exactly. I think <laughs> I think you're right. Yep. <laughs> I've never I've never met your husband, but someday I'm going to, like, run into him, and he's like, hey, are you the guy that made fun of me on the show for not liking Twitter? I'm like, no, that wasn't me. That was some other guy. That was Matt Miller, not Jake Miller. <laughs> <laughs> now Matt's going to come after you. Yeah, you're really digging yourself into a hole here, Jake. Maybe, maybe we should start recording all over again. Yeah. I don't even know. <laughs> So right now we're it's the weekend while Jamie and I are recording right now and I have three kids and I had to like quarantine them away from me so I could record for a little bit. I can't imagine what you have to do to get six kids to leave you alone for long enough for this call. Yeah, I just left. I I got up and I left the house because you're right. It's pretty impossible. I mean, only five are living at home. Our oldest is at college now, which is crazy. Um, But yeah, I just had to leave. I just told my husband, I'm out of here. I'm going to do technology stuff. And he's just, you know, shakes his head and lets me go. So it's great. (laughs) Shakes his head and then shakes his fist at the technology. Like, all right, technology. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) He stays home and does his hipster stuff. And yeah, but our kids are so much older now your kids are still young and um you know my youngest is seven so she's pretty much self you know she takes care of herself she's she's she had to she's the youngest of six so she just had to figure it out pretty quick i just can't imagine that must be some busy years of your life right there with set with six kiddos That's yeah crazy. yeah it's fun yep. though right it's fun oh yeah yeah i love i love dad life it's a blast it so is. what else is going on with you right now Okay, so uh, we're just starting spring break. Uh, today is my first official day of spring break, uh, even nice. though it's a Saturday. I'm going to count it. Um, count. So, yeah, we have our, our spring break. And because I teach in the same district that my kids attend school, we're always on the same spring break. So we're getting ready for that. That means wrapping up third quarter um, for school, for them, for me. And then we're also wrapping up the end of semester or we, we call them sessions, but class sessions for some online classes that I teach. So it's all kind of coming together at the same time, which is a little nuts, but it's okay. We've got, you know, a week off. So that's the best part of it. Yeah. Good time to wrap that stuff up. So tell us about those extra courses you teach on the side there. So after I became a Google innovator, um, which I'm, which I'm totally jealous of you for, by the way. Yeah. You got to get there. Come on, Jake, you can do it. It's a, it's I'm, just, I'm a Google trainer and I am an innovator, but I'm not a Google innovator. You get to put those two words together and like have them in your bio and your signature and stuff like that. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, you are more than qualified. You definitely you could do it. You just gotta, you know, submit that application. That was the hardest part of it all, getting that application done. But after I went through that whole process, which was incredible, I got to go to London, meet some great people. But Malik Walsh reached out to me on Twitter and I was a big um, Ohio head chat person. Like on Twitter, I was, I was coming in and I know you were too. So every, you know, Mm -hmm. Wednesday was it Wednesday at eight or nine, whenever we did that. And so someone on there had, had mentioned to Malik that um, I'm a Google innovator and he was looking for Google certified or Google trainers or Google innovators to teach his classes. So he reached out to me. I've still to this day never met Malik, but uh, he reached out to me and asked me if I would want to join the team. And so it's just a group of educators and we're from all over and we teach these courses online and and you can take them for grad credit or just for in-service credit. The coolest thing is, is that it's cheap. Right now mm-hmm. they're running, like typically it's $400 for a three credit, which is pretty cheap for three college credits. But um, if you're a new student, it's only $200 right now. So that's oh. like unheard of. So I get to 
teach people all over the world. Um, everything's online. Everything's asynchronous. You know, I don't have to dedicate an hour each week at the same time or anything like that. And neither mm-hmm. do my students. So they can do the work whenever they, you know, can get to it. And we run sessions. And then um, if you don't finish the work in the first session, that's okay. You can have another session. Oh. So it's really nice, laid back, stress-free kind of PD. Mm-hmm. And that is, I think, something every teacher deserves. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Though that sounds awesome. I bet there's some people listening in who are going to be interested in that to get that training, not just for the fact that they'll get those, you know, credit hours or whatever they need for their, their uh, contracts and their certifications and things like that, but just for the learning. I know we got a passionate group of learners here listening to the show and that might be a great tool for them to look into. Yeah, we have some incredible courses. I wish I had time to take some of the other ones because the the write-ups are so interesting to me. And and they cover a lot of different bases and we're always expanding too. In fact, I've, I'm talking with Malik right now about adding two more courses. So it's it's a great little uh group of people. All all of the instructors are very passionate and very good at what they're doing. So it's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing here on the, on the website, which I'm going to put the link in the show notes. It's edtechnologyspecialist.com, but I'm looking at the grad courses and I see 22 here and there's some about motivating girls to, uh, to, to move towards careers in STEM. There's Google classroom courses. There's G suite courses. There's game-based learning courses and genius hour and 21st century tools and digital natives to digital citizens and writing related courses and all kinds of stuff. This is, looks like some pretty awesome content here. More awesome than like the average university tends to be offering too. Yeah. And it's a little less stuffy than that as well. Mm -hmm. So like we really, we really want to give teachers what they're looking for. Um, We want that time and that money to be, you know, like well worth it. Oftentimes, you know, we're all teachers, we're all busy. We, most of us have families too and, you know, lives and it's just like, oh, I got to take this class just to get it over with, just to renew my license, you know, and oftentimes it's just like a kind of something you're not too into and you're just doing Mm -hmm. it to get the credits. And so that's what we're trying to fix there. We want that it to be worth their time and worth their money Mm -hmm. and that they'll actually, you know, learn. So, yeah. So I see on the, on the site that the spring session starts up April 10th, which is just a a few weeks after this uh, episode will be airing. So what will you be teaching in the spring session? I'm going to teach a course called 21st Century Skills for Engagement. And it's just like a basic course on technology basically like we kind of go over everything we we start out with the g suite tools and then we move into some twitter formative assessment qr codes e-readers there's just a whole lot of things covered in the course and it's basically just using tech to engage your students nice cool so i see that it's a a three graduate credit hour course which Uh is a good good chunk of of hours to get in there and it's starting up here pretty soon so we're going to put the link to that in show notes maybe you'll get some uh some duct tapers in your next course That'd be awesome. Yeah. And if they can't make it by that April 10th, again, like it's laid back, you can register whenever. Um, It just really, it's up to you, the student, when they need those credit hours, you know, but it's, it's, it's really nice. I think it's a real teacher friendly platform. Oh, very cool. Cool. I hope some people go in and check that out. And I'm I'm excited about the list of courses here. I like that some of them are kind of learning to use technology more effectively. Like there's one that's just about Google Chrome, but then others of them are really, you know, pedagogical driven, but, you know, still relate to technology, but they're really driven by, by um, pedagogy, which is cool that, you know, whatever the learner needs is probably in there. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what we're going for. We're just really trying to tailor to the teachers. Yeah, that's great. That's really awesome. Okay, so let's now, before we get into the educational technology stuff, let's let's play a little game here. You ready for a game? Yes. Okay, so first up, we're going to play a game of two truths and one lie. And I have to warn you in advance, I am horrible at two truths and one lie. You're going to say three statements. I'm going to try to guess which one's a lie. I'm going to get it wrong. You're going to laugh at me. Everybody else running on their treadmill or driving their car is going to laugh at me. And then I'm going to try to guess again. And uh, who knows? Maybe I'll get it sooner or later. It might take me three guesses, though. Okay. (laughs) Two truths and one lie. So go ahead. What do you got for me? Here are your three things. Okay. I've, I've been over and over these in my head, so I, I hope I hope I can trick you. Okay. So my first one is that I played basketball at the collegiate level. Okay. My second one is that I have 11 brothers and sisters. Okay. And my final is that my kids have met um, our former president, Barack Obama. Oh, man. Oh, those are three good ones. Okay. So I know, I know you're tall. So, yep. so the, the basketball one is believable. 
You do have six kids of your own, so it wouldn't shock me if you came from a family of 11. Um, And the Barack Obama thing, hmm, I'm guessing that one's a lie. I'm guessing you've never, never met President Obama or your kids have never met President Obama. You are terrible at this, Jake. Oh, man. You're right. No. (laughs) Um, So I thought that was going to be like a total giveaway because for years, my Twitter header photo or like the, you know, the one that goes across the top was a picture of my kids with former President Barack Obama. Oh, Um, I I missed it. It was, I did change it like probably, I don't know, like two or three years ago. Um, So it hasn't been that for a while, but I'm like, oh, he might remember that. Um, But yeah, my kids got to meet him. Um, He was actually president then and he was campaigning for his next term. And uh, I have a little brother who is also a pretty big nerd and his job was, he recently retired, but he was in the Air Force and his job was, he was in charge of communications on Air Force One. So whenever the president was flying, he got to fly and once he came to Cleveland. And so we got to get in there. And it was honestly like the only time in my life I've ever been starstruck. Oh yeah, totally. Um, like just, I, I had heard the term and, you know, understood what it meant, but never experienced it. And, and especially cause my kids got to like shake his hand and he like talked to them. It was just, it was awesome. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I would freak out if I got to met, meet President Obama. That's crazy. So yeah. were, were, was it crazy to your kids or were they just like, oh, check out the airplane? <laughs> uh, well, like the older kids sort of, you know, got how, um, so I think my oldest, he was probably like 12 at the time. So they were, you know, like my oldest two, like 12 and 10, they, they pretty much understood it. And now they think it's like the best, you know, they right. love bragging about it now, but I, at the time, I'm not sure they understood how huge you know and we kept like beating into their heads my husband and i were like that's the most powerful man in the world you understand and (laughs) they're just like yeah that was cool it's raining though and we're freezing so (laughs) you're like yeah Um, whatever can we go to chipotle afterwards yeah i'd love it if my kids ate chipotle but they don't oh my gosh okay all right i know wrong here your husband is like technology and your kids don't like chipotle (laughs) i I know you're finding out all the truths this is this is embarrassing listen i like you jamie but i don't like the rest of your family i just (laughs) (laughs) i'm trying jake i'm trying (laughs) all right so so next up let's play a game of i I can't tell you the name of this game because it's copyright infringement if i say the name so i actually call this game which of these things are less adequate for your preferences (laughs) (laughs) which of these things are less adequate for your preferences but i think i think actually you're going to tell me the one that's more adequate you know what i mean like which one which one do you feel better about which one's more adequate for your preferences so first up would you rather eat no candy at Halloween or no turkey at Thanksgiving? Oh, so easy. No candy. But Jake, you didn't ever figure out my lie. Oh, I, oh my gosh. I don't figure out your lie. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we did the, the, the truth, but we didn't figure out. You didn't figure out my lie. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's. Okay. All right. So you, let, let's just pretend that never happened. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So your kids met. President Barack Obama. They were they, they were psyched about meeting him. Some of them. They right. didn't want to go to Chipotle afterwards. No. But something else is a lie here. Either you did not play collegiate basketball, or what was the other one? Uh, Eleven brothers and sisters. Eleven brothers and sisters. I'm thinking the collegiate basketball is the lie. No offense to your athletic ability. <laughs> it's absolutely. It's absolutely the lie. The yeah. Lie. No, I did not play. I didn't even make the varsity team in high school. So um, <laughs> yeah. I did not play basketball at the college level. I did play softball though. So you know what though? I got that in two guesses. That's pretty good. I'm pretty good. That cool is. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> I got true. Down to, I got down to the 50, 50 and then I got it right. <laughs> Nailed it. I got it Way as to a go. Win. <laughs> oh, <laughs> as a win. <laughs> That's why I thought you were like just trying to get out of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is my first time ever recording this show. This is new to me. How do we do this? <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, well, let's get into the educational technology now. We're going to talk about some educational duct tape now. And so just to refresh the memory of our listeners, and, and just exciting note today, Jamie, we are up to 30 listeners to the show today. Oh, you got to be kidding. Listeners. That's amazing. Super, That's great. Super psyched. Two or three of them are new. So just so Woo-hoo. they know, I'm going to tell them about educational duct tape. And so educational duct tape is my goofy metaphor that says that educational technology is at its most useful when it is a tool used to meet goals in the classroom or solve problems a teacher might have in the classroom or address some needs they may have in the classroom rather than being the actual end goal itself. And it's the same with duct tape. Duct tape, you know, you don't say like today I'm going to use duct tape. You 
address the problems and goals that you have in life. And sometimes duct tape becomes useful. Educational technology is the same thing. So that's the educational duct tape metaphor. So now I'm going to ask you a question and we're going to try to patch this question with some educational duct tape, which would be ed tech. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Sounds great. Okay. So here's our first question. How can we perform formative assessments of student comprehension? So I'm sure this is something that you teach about in that course about student engagement. So how do you recommend to your students that they perform formative assessments for student comprehension? So uh, you had me a little tripped up there. You were like, how do you perform? How do you ask your students? I was like, wait, what? Uh, uh, <laughs> teachers. But now I, re- I understand that <laughs> teachers are my students. Yeah. <laughs> in that course, I do address it. And I talk about it in my you know day-to-day high school job as well. So there's so many tools out there, right, that we could use. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think the real way for you to figure out which ones work for you are to just always keep trying new ones. And just like the coolest thing that I think about using some of these tools is instead of always being the one to send out the questions, I like letting the students do the uh, development of the question. Mm-hmm. and let them give it to each other or um, even even more fun sometimes is when they develop some questions and they you know get to see if the teacher actually can answer those questions nice. yeah, you know like you know kind of turn the tables on the teacher because kids I think get into that a lot but yeah there's mm-hmm. so many great tools you know with Kahoot and Quizlet and Pear Deck and Google Forms quizzes all those great ones so there's enough for you to find what works well for you and there's enough for you to continue to change it up so that it's like, you know, not boring for the kids or they don't figure out how to hack. Um, We've, we've had some really hilarious, you know, cahoots going on and kids from another like class period will join and we're like, how'd they get that? Mm. You know, they they just text each other the codes and then all of a sudden you've got, you know, Abe Lincoln in your class and you're like, what is going on? They can't even see the questions and it's hilarious. But (laughs) Um, I do think that there's just so many great tools out there that you can figure out where your students are with content and with with what you're teaching so that you don't waste time moving forward if they're not ready or some of them are, Mm -hmm. some of them aren't. So, you know, I really, really love Brain Pop. Um, Even though it's a paid, I just love so much how you can see whole class, individual. Uh, I think it's engaging. I, again, am such a nerd. I I think it's funny. I like actually laugh out loud at some of the robot jokes that they do. Um, But Brain Pop is, it's, you know, now that I'm a high school teacher, it's a little different as there's not as much content for high school. Uh But uh, it was a huge favorite of mine when I was in elementary. Yeah, so I'm actually not familiar with that. I, I know Brain Pop, I know Tim, I know Moby, and I know that there's, right, right. there's a different character in the, the Brain Pop Junior. Yep. Uh, and I know that each video, if you're a subscriber, comes with some other resources. And I've seen that there's like a quiz in there, but I don't know mm-hmm. what the formative assessment piece is in there. So tell me about that. Yeah, they really stepped up their game because um, like most educators – In the past, that's what it was. It was just videos, right? And um, just animated shorts explaining a tough concept. Mm -hmm. But now they have it so, you know, the children can log in and it's it's so easy. It's single sign-on with Google and they can just, um, they can answer those questions. You can assign content to specific students or the whole class. And then they have both a easy quiz and a harder quiz after each movie. And they can take them individually. You can take them whole group and and do it that way. Most of the time, um, I always had them take them individually so that there wasn't that, you know, competition and all the, Mm -hmm. where you know, where you single the kid out and they feel dumb because they didn't get it right. Um, So that is how Brain Pop does it now. And they also have not only just these multiple choice quizzes, but they have open-ended challenges. They they have a game that links to everything. So like... uh, they could go do some sort of game-based challenge that relates to the content. Mm-hmm. They've really stepped up their game. And it's tough because it's it's a paid application. Mm-hmm. So defending it, you know, to the people that hold the checkbook, it's like, you you just, you got to see it. Like, you know, mm-hmm. so cause a lot of teachers just assume, oh, it's just little movies. Right. But it's really, it's really a lot more now. Yeah, well, I think two things about about a paid tool like this. Number one, it depends on how how much it's being used, right? If it's if it's going to mm-hmm. be used across the district by dozens of teachers and they're going to use it regularly throughout a whole lot of different units and topics and things like that, then then yeah, you you should pay for it, right? There's nothing right. wrong with paying for a tool like that. And then also, like when you go to say to your administration or whatever, like, hey, I think we should subscribe to this tool showing them something like the data that you get about the students and their performance it can be really powerful. Like, so it's not just, this is a video tool to show my students videos. It's 
this is providing them with some student pacing because they could watch the videos at whatever time. This yep. is really supporting flip learning. And look at this data I get back so that I know which kids need my like one-on-one -on -one support or some kind of remedial support on these topics, right? Right, absolutely. And, and, that, and they like really... It's a slam dunk on those too, you know, going yeah. back to my basketball days, but um, <laughs> <laughs> they do. Brain Pop has just great data afterwards. And again, you can look at it whole class or individual. And, and the best part is that the kids like it. I mean, right. it is, it's funny, it's engaging and it's quick too. You know, if you want to understand, like oftentimes when somebody says to me, oh, do you know like Fibonacci sequence? And I'm like, yeah, but I don't really. I can right. just go like quickly watch a brain pop and I'm like, oh, I get it now. I get right. it. Right. And Tim and Moby um, nail it and then you can take it. Yeah. And, and then I look that, smart. Right? Right. Yes. <laughs> so I like to, I like a couple of different things about this. Number one, I'm looking on their website because I've never done the formative assessment. I'm looking at the way it looks to the teacher to see the assessment. And you could, I could look really quickly at this picture and know, number one, how does my class, how's my class doing on this? Number two, which specific students are doing well on it and which parts are they struggling with? But then I can also see that they've completed it too, right? So that's right. that's often the worry with flipped classrooms or whatever when when you use or blended, whether it's flipped or blended or whatever, right. when you use a video as an instructional tool, it's hard to be certain that the students have actually watched it and retained what it taught. Um, right. And this proves that. It proves number one, they watched it and it proves number two, that they retained it because you see the correct answers there. Yeah. And again, it's a really great differentiation tool because there's not only, you know, the quizzes that they can take after they've mm -hmm. got those mind maps on there. They have even this really cool make a movie that that's really engaging for kids. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've seen that in there. yeah. So there's a lot of different ways that you can prove that you're understanding the content beyond just the quizzes, although the quizzes are quick and uh, they're great. Yeah. So those of you out there that are Brain Pop subscribers, go check that out. So I'm going to share. I, li I like that you shared a tool that, that people are familiar with, but maybe a use of it that they're not familiar with, you know, because mm -hmm. people would think of it as a just a video platform. Um, right. but you're sharing that other little perk there. So I'm going to share about one of the tools you already mentioned, which is quizzes. Uh, one of my favorite ways to use quizzes, which is not the way that people generally use it, right? So for those people out there that don't know quizzes, I find that almost everybody knows Kahoot. So mm -hmm. quizzes and Kahoot are pretty similar. So whereas Kahoot puts the question up on the screen and the multiple choice on the student screen, they, they choose on their, on their own screen. And then it's, it's synchronous for the most part and more of a game atmosphere. Quizzes is asynchronous. So the students can move at their own pace and the questions are just on their screen. But otherwise, it's very similar. It gives them good uh, data afterwards. And kids tend to have fun with it. They've got the fun memes after the question. Right. Yeah, those uh, are good. And so it's a nice little like review tool and data collection and formative assessment tool. But one way I really like using it is something called the Fast and the Curious Edu Protocol. Have you seen that or EDU Protocol? No, no, I've never heard of that. So I first heard of it on uh, Matt Miller's site, uh, Ditch That Textbook. And I'm going to link that in here. And I think he actually got it from a book by Marlena Heburn, I hope I'm pronouncing her last name right, and John Carippo. You know, they're just people on Twitter, so I don't know how to, how to pronounce their names. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they, they wrote a book called The Edu Protocol Field Guide, which I haven't read yet, but it's on my to read list. And so the Edu Protocol Guide is a lot of like, lessons and, and activities that they've kind of created the the skeleton of and the teachers then they just substitute in their content and use these edu protocols. And this is one of those protocols. So what they do in this protocol is instead of using a quizzes after the lesson or the activity or after the instruction is given, they use it kind of before and during. Okay. okay. So in other words, you're, you're doing like a, like a pre-assessment and you're doing a post-assessment with the same tool and you're also ah. giving the kids that buy-in. So what you do is you administer the assessment and then you see how they're doing. They don't know the answers or they shouldn't know the answers because you're right, preparing to new. teach them that content, right? right it's new. Mm -hmm. And so it might spark their interest in the ones that they get wrong. Right. And then mm -hmm. also then, then you'd, re-give them that same quizzes a couple of days later, and then you see, did they grow, right? And I think in the actual Edge Protocol field guide, the way they suggest it is you do it once and then keep going until they hit a certain number, like say 95%. So okay. you, you develop, you, you give it to them on Monday, you see where they're at, you teach them only the stuff that you need to teach them based on that feedback, or maybe they get differentiated instruction based on their feedback and their peers' feedback or, or score, I should say. And sure. then you do it again and again and again until you say like, hey, the whole class has got this and then you move on, right? Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, yeah I mean, mastery learning, right? I mean, that's great. Right, and so whereas you normally sit down and you say, okay, this is gonna take us four days, you might find out, hey, this is only gonna take us three days because on day three, mm -hmm. we average the 95% in the class. So I know they've got it, right? Right. Or yeah, that's really maybe cool. on day four, when you're expecting to be done, they're still only averaging an 82%. And you're like, well, 
now I have proof that I need to add another day to this little unit here. Mm -hmm. And I know exactly where they're having the issues and I know exactly where to move on. But also, you know who those kids are that already have it. And so you don't have to keep giving them the instruction on it. You could, you know, differentiate your class in some way until you get the whole class up there, but not force those high achieving kids to continue repeating the same material, right? Yeah, I think that's awesome because, you know, like so many times we talk about differentiation, gosh, if I could say it. (laughs) And I always, you know, you think of it from the teacher end, like, what do I have to teach and how can I cover all my bases? But we we need to remember, too, those students that, that are struggling and just need such a different approach or the ones also that have got it and really need to be like kind of set free to do something either deeper or completely, you know, move on to the next content. So I think it's really important to always, always think about it both ways because so many times teachers are just thinking, ah, differentiation, it's, it's such a, you know, it adds so much more time to your prep and and to your teaching. Mm -hmm. So this is a great tool to help alleviate some of that time teacher. Right. And that, that's really what formative assessment is supposed to be, right? Yeah. It's supposed to formatively assess how you're going to teach something. It's supposed to formatively assess how you're going to differentiate. And it's supposed to formatively assess when you're done. Right. Right. So you, you create, instead of creating a pre-assessment and a mid-lesson formative assessment and a post-assessment to prove you're ready to go on, you create one thing yep. And then you just use it at different times throughout until you're certain that you're that you're done, right? And there might be some other activity that you use to be your your true end assessment to right. make sure they have a really deep level of learning that's not just multiple mm-hmm. choice, but still it's proving to you when you're able to do that final assessment or move on or whatever it might be. Yeah, and with all the tools that are out there, you oftentimes probably don't even need to develop your own, right? It's probably already created. Someone already right. did it. Yeah. yeah, you just go through go through and maybe right. edit the questions or whatever based on your right. needs. Yeah. And the thing I like about quizzes too, in comparison to things like Kahoot, is it doesn't have to be live. You can assign mm-hmm. it as homework. So you could just send the kids a link to it and they could get to it whenever they're ready to. So you could even be saying to them, okay, now go back to the to the Fast and the Curious um, quizzes and reassess yourself and see what yeah. level you're at. Okay. So, so maybe they determine when they're ready to be done and move on to the final assessment or whatever it is. And so that, so by developing one tool and then using it at a variety of times, you've kind of hit all those. those yeah, and I like there. that they're competing against themselves. That's really cool. Yep. Yeah, me too. Okay. So I know you, you kind of brought a question to the table too. So what's your question? So, um, I, my question for you, Jake, is that since it's becoming more challenging to keep our students engaged and a huge shift in learning, it's occurred in some places and hopefully it's, it's, it, you know, I hope some people are in the process of shifting teaching and learning because we're no longer preparing kids, you know, for life in a factory. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. So how can we provide opportunities for more hands-on discovery learning and uh, more problem solving for our kids? Yeah, so I think here it doesn't necessarily even have to utilize technology to do this. These are things that we learned about when we were undergrads becoming teachers, right? These are these different ped- pedagogical like strategies that we know to be best for kids. There, differentiation. There, you know, maybe we didn't learn about it in, in undergrad, but they're project based or problem based learning, and they're also, I think, design thinking. Because if we're creating these kids who are independent thinkers and self directed learners and able to create things to represent their learning, then I really think we're preparing them for their futures, right? So if we could give the kids the power to say when they understand something and identify what they need to do otherwise, then we're developing them for their futures, right? And then, then we're making them inherently more engaged because they're empowered. Mm-hmm. So if if we use something like that Fast and the Curious Edu Protocol, and we do it in a way that is uh, asynchronous, and a kid is determining when they're ready to move on, if they're determining when they're ready to re- retake that quizzes, and if we're letting them determine when they've met the minimum standard for that that assessment, and then they're moving on to maybe something that involves them as creators. So if they're then getting a choice, maybe from like a uh, a project options menu or a activity menu where they say, okay, now that you've proven that you have a basic knowledge, like a DOK one level knowledge of this topic by answering these multiple, multiple choice questions correctly, now choose to create a Spark video or a Google drawing or a infographic in Canva or a stop motion slides in Google Slides to represent your thinking here. So now the kids are self-directed in determining when they're ready to move on. They are self-determining what the best way to communicate something is. And they're also developing their own ability to communicate their understanding of something. And those are, I think, are the skills that we need to see in our students. Then there are other things that go in there too. Like, so we need to build in some collaboration. We need to build in not just student voice, 
uh, but student choice. So, so letting them choose what they're going to learn about as well as when they're going to be done with the topic mm-hmm. and things like that. So I think there's a lot of things we talk about in educational duct tape that all kind of fit in here just in the regular learning classroom. And then there's other stuff we could do outside of the regular content areas that I think really reach like the whole child, so to speak, that, that we know that we need kids that are that are good at being self-directed learners and good at math and good at language arts. But then there are other skills that we kind of owe it to the kids to develop in them. And I'm, I'm betting that you have an answer that relates to that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And <laughs> I also like just listening to you over here. I'm just like nodding my head and I'm in a room alone, right? And so I'm just like, <laughs> yes, yes, and preach. Um, but I, I hear all of these awesome things that you're saying. And, and what keeps popping in my head is that, you know, we're teaching these kids confidence along the way too, you know, like right. they're becoming really confident about themselves um, and they're feeling empowered about what they know and mm-hmm. about, you know, how to move forward with their learning. So I love that. I thought that was, you know, and all from quizzes, you know, like <laughs> it's great. Right. It's just, right. it's awesome. So yeah, definitely. Um, well, I know that, you know, I, my day to day life is spent in a maker space. And so I get to see a lot of that, um, self guided learning. Uh, I get to mm-hmm. see some kids come in here who might not shine, you know, on the football field or, uh, in the music room or anything, you know, maybe not even in their academics, but they come in here and they, you know, see a problem and maybe I, beg them to help me fix the 3D printer that we have. And, okay. and they take this whole thing apart and they put it all back together and they might throw out a question, you know, every now and then like, Hey, Mrs. Chandler, do you know, you know how to blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Google it, check YouTube. You know, I, my <laughs> constant answers that I'm yeah. responding with because I don't know them, but also because I know those are good yeah. tools that where the kids can yeah. find the answers. And, and sometimes they will, and sometimes they'll just keep, like at it and like, well, if this is this, then I'm going to have to go this way and do that. So they, they figure it out, you know, through their own thinking and through their own process, which is really cool to watch. And I'm always pleasantly surprised, you know, by the outcome. They've, they haven't broken anything yet. They're mostly um, the ones fixing my mistakes. So the makerspace is what I think is a great way to keep kids engaged and giving them opportunities for just some of this like unknown learning, right? Like we don't even know why they would need to learn how to fix a 3D printer, but the the process that they go through and uh, sometimes, you know, other kids come along and they, and they watch or they help or they offer suggestions and and watching Mm -hmm. that teamwork is really incredible too. Because again, they're just like, they're in it and they're, they just, they want to fix the problem. They want to solve this puzzle. And that's the most passionate learner because they're just determined to get through it. So I see it a lot every day in in the makerspace up at the high school and, and, more times than not, it's not related to uh, content or curriculum. It's just something they've run into in everyday life or in the middle of trying to create something. Something doesn't function the way it should, and then they figure out why and fix it. Right. I like that you're what you're so what you're saying there essentially is they are developing competencies, right? They're, like you yeah. said about the 3D printer, those kids are not going to go out in the world and be a 3D printer repairman. Right, right. But they they are at some point in their life going to be met with a problem that they need to solve. And it might not even be technology related, but they now have had an experience where they were self-motivated and they drove their own troubleshooting process Mm -hmm. to fix this problem, right? So I expected you when you said Makerspace to say, oh, I like seeing students learn how to you know, create a 3D model or so something, but you right. want a totally different way, which is really exciting about the troubleshooting because that those are skills that kids need to develop. Right. And I, I feel like that's what I'm doing all day long, really, you know, right. it's, it's just troubleshooting. And, and I do try to pass it on to the kids as often as I can. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes it's selfish, like I'm busy, I'm doing something else. I can't really help you right now. So mm-hmm. I, you know, <laughs> but um, right. yeah, it's really cool to see how proud they are when they're like, I fixed it. I did. I fixed it. You know, and then someone will be like, no way. And they come over and yeah, I just did this and this. And and it's just like, you totally did fix it. And then they don't even have time or they don't even remember what the like reason they were coming in here for the first place. You know, maybe it was just to print a 3d model of their favorite video game character or something like that. But um, they walk out of here, you know, after 40 minutes and they're just like, you know, so, so happy, so proud of themselves. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, because they figured something out on their own. There was there was a problem and nobody knew how to solve it and they figured it out. And they were they directed how they were gonna do it and they led themselves through it. And all you had to do was say some things throughout like, Hey, maybe look it up on YouTube right. or hey, 
check Google or, and, and then you're also showing the kids your confidence in them, mm-hmm. right? You're saying, Hey, um, Susan, I don't know how to fix that. Um, but I bet you can figure it out. Right. Why don't you look it up? And I, and I bet you could do it. And then you do it, you know, she does it and she's like, Whoa, look at me. You know, yeah. like, I, I can do that. Right. So you're empowering them. Yeah. And then like even further, like down the line, you know, say two weeks later, same problem happens and different student. And I was like, you know, you got to talk to so-and-so because that kid figured it out. And so then she connects with that student and maybe those are two people who would have never, you know, been on the same level, you know, one's a senior, one's a freshman or one's in AP classes and one, you know, is in inclusion learning or something, you know, where just the relationships that develop because of one kid's success and another kid's similar problem. Mm -hmm. And they, Mm -hmm. you know, then they learn together and it's so cool. Those are like always my favorite moments when one kid is teaching the other, like because of their success that they had, they're like, Oh yeah, no, it's so easy. Watch this. And then the other kid is suddenly, you know, their student. So cool. Right. So then think about that ripple, ripple effect right there Mm -hmm. where the, where the first kid that fixed it gets to see themselves as a trusted expert and sees that they achieved something that their teacher is now recommending them as an expert in. And then that other kid is now seeing the potential of the people around them, right? Right. Even if, whether they knew that person or don't know the person or go on to be friends or don't go on to be friends, they're seeing that, that their classmates have these abilities that they may not have realized were there. Yeah, absolutely. It's like these like hidden little treasures. (laughs) Yeah. So we we tend to not want to trust kids to fix things like Mm -hmm. that or to troubleshoot things like that because there's a risk, right? There there certainly is a risk, right? That that kid might break your 3D printer. Yeah, he he might. I know. But, I've been lucky. But, I've been lucky. <laughs> right. He he might also become super proud of what he achieved and other students might see his ability to do that. And he might start to see himself as a more capable uh, learner or technology user. And that ripple effect might go through the rest of his life. Right. So right. hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Maybe yeah. you end up with a broken 3D printer that you have to right. for support on, but <laughs> maybe you have impacted this kid's life, and that's huge. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I got the warranty, so it's good. It's yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're worth it. We're, it's worth it. But, they might tell you you broke the warranty by letting it. Right, <laughs> exactly. Who did you have service that machine? Oh, he's a freshman at school. <laughs> Jimmy, he's in seventh period language arts. Right, and he came over. <laughs> Yeah. So so tell me, what are in the makerspace? What are like two or three of your favorite uh, tools or websites or hands-on things or projects or whatever that you use in there? Um, So we have a lot in in a small space. It's just like an extension of our library. Uh, It's just a room where we can close the door, and the environment is is very different from any other place in the school. You know, I let the kids play music. So we have an Amazon echo that they can, um, you know, learn some AI skills with. And nice. but basically they use it to play Despacito, um, <laughs> which can get old, but no, that, so it's just a different environment. I let them eat in here. I let them talk. Uh, so it's very social learning so that mm-hmm. when they come in, there's, they've got a laser, they've got, um, a silhouette cameo. They've got a lot of coding, electronics, materials, sewing, crocheting, carvey, to do some CNC routing and we've got three 3d printers, but the best thing that we have in here is like super low tech. And it's what brings most kids into the doorway is the button maker, mm. <laughs> which like, I've seen, I've seen you tweet. Yeah, that, yeah. They love it. And, and it's just hilarious how um, it evolves. So they come in and they want to airdrop a picture off their phone and make it into uh-huh. a button to put on their backpack or their lanyard with their uh-huh. ID. And so right there, they're learning like a ton of skills. They're learning how to airdrop. They're mm-hmm. learning how to crop with a circle shape. They're learning about like the diameter of the pin and all that good stuff. They're learning how to print. And they think the color printer is like the coolest thing ever too. So that's fun. Um, I'm like, it's nice. just a printer. But um, uh-huh. but so that's like step one and it gets them in the door. And then maybe two weeks later, they're 3D printing or they're using the laser. So I love any of our like low barrier of entry to- tools that we have in here. We have a lot where they just come in, maybe do some Sculpey clay or make some jewelry or make a button. And then yeah. that introduces them to this completely different environment that, you know, I always say I'm tricking the kids into learning because they come in here and think they're just hanging out and having fun, but really they're like figuring so much out. So I love our yeah. like, low end tools because that's what brings all the kids in. Yeah, it's funny that you bring that up because we have, as you know, a, a fab lab at our school. Right. And at first, when we when we first got it, we were apprehensive to let kids do things that didn't really involve them doing a lot of learning. So like we have vinyl cutters and kids will want to come in and they'll want to like 
cut out a Nike swoosh, for right. example, and put it onto their backpack or something. And at first I was hesitant to let them do that. But then what I realized was this low barrier thing that you're saying here, like if they can come in and they could do that in 15 or 20 minutes and get a confidence booster out of it and potentially see somebody cutting something on the CNC router right. or 3D printing something that they designed themselves or vinyl, like still vinyl cutting, but doing a vinyl cut of something they made themselves, not just download from right. the internet, then you might be developing that in that student, right? Yeah. And actually, we just had an open house not too long ago. And I had a parent ask me, you know, like, why do you let the kids print other people's designs, right? Because right. I promote Thingiverse and I tell the kids to go on there and check it out. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, you know, first of all, those those designs are free to use. You know, people mm-hmm. put them up there for that reason. But second of all, it gets them engaged. Like, they mm-hmm. they don't know how to 3D design for their needs until they truly understand, you know, what 3D printing is. So they have to right. kind of grasp that. And same thing with the vinyl cutter. Like, yeah, um, they've made Under Armour, right? Stickers right. and like put them on their binders. And then the next thing I know, I've got art students coming in, scanning in their drawings and turning those into stickers or, you know, putting them on a piece of wood with the laser. And that, again, like I love watching kids teach each other, but I also love when it's a product that they like created completely mm-hmm. from like beginning to end. That's really yeah. nice too. Yeah, that's cool. I, I love that how you how you're embracing that low barrier stuff because you know that it has that that potential to get them to you know the more high barrier stuff, but they've already are over that low barrier, so they're already partway there. You know, we had a kid come into our fab lab recently and wanted to uh, 3D print a new mouthpiece for his saxophone or something. Yeah. I think it was a saxophone, and he found it on Thingiverse, and I was like, well. We're, we're not just your your music, music instrument repair supply right, right here. Right. And he said, well, no, Mr. Miller, this one on Thingiverse is the wrong size. I've got to make it fit my saxophone. And I'm like, oh, oh okay, cool. So right. he went in and he, like, he changed it and he, he made some changes to to the you know the the setup of it to make it match the way he liked the mouthpiece to to his saxophone to be and so he actually went in downloaded the design design and then modified it to fit his needs and that's yeah that's super cool because now he's got those abilities to do that right and he and he may not have known that had he not seen someone else's 3d printed mouthpiece you know uh, we actually did that too our, our kids played in a winter parade so uh-huh. it was like freezing and they all were like coming up here to print mouthpieces because theirs were metal oh, so yeah. their lips were like freezing so i was like oh that's so smart good yeah. job guys do it, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah yeah i think that you know when they come in these doors and like again we let them do uh, personal things too they don't have not it doesn't have to be connected to curriculum they can come in here and make a you know birthday card for their friend if they want it right. doesn't have to be school related and i think that's another reason they come in because they have you know something in the back of their head like uh, i forgot my mom's birthday's tonight and i better get a present so they come in here and they make her some little like you know bracelet or something but they would never have come in here had they not had that you know selfish moment where they needed to do create something for themselves or or you know i guess it's not so selfish they're making for their mom so that's nice but then they can start to see oh, I could totally use this for my English project right. or I'm going to go shoot a video down there because I saw they had a green screen mm-hmm. and so I'm going to come back. And so just, I mean, it's like I'm a car salesman, right? I got to like get them in the door. Yeah. and <laughs> yeah. But then eventually it, it gets where it needs to be, like mm-hmm. where they are using these tools to get into some like really serious learning. Yeah. So I'm going to ask a favor of you here because I, because I'm guessing some of the people are not nodding their heads in their cars or on the treadmill or whatever, as they listen to you say that stuff. And they're like, I want this too. So will you do me a favor and give me, um, you know, put in the show notes for me links to some of the things you have in the lab? Would you be up for that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've got like a, um, you know, Google slides presentation where it it shows each, each item that we have. And then it links out to, you know, like, uh, lesson ideas or resources of how to use that machine. Yeah. It's kind of like where, when I go to conferences, that's what I use to nice. present about the hub. So yeah, absolutely. I can send you that. Nice. Cause I know people tend to be like, what do you recommend for makerspace? And I think it all depends on what you're trying to achieve, but it's always nice to be able to see what other people have and, and what they like and to, and to hear kind of your strategy of how you have those low barrier tools. So I think that's probably super helpful for people. Yeah, that's what we were in the process of of planning ours. And we were like, well, the best way to figure this out is just go see them all. So it, we were lucky that we had, you know, some time and flexibility and the support yeah. of our administration to go on these little field trips and view other makerspaces. But be even better if you could do it from your machine. You know, you don't even have to get permission to leave. You can just kind of <laughs> yep. go through and view. And I, I think that as makerspaces become more prevalent, that um, 
we'll hopefully be getting to the point where everyone has kind of a virtual little representation so that all of us makers can unite and make the ultimate maker space. Yeah. The ultimate maker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For well, sure. hopefully everybody's going to check that out in the show notes and they're going to follow you on Twitter at jchanter 22. So they could reach out to you if they have questions on it. Absolutely. And maybe they're going to hit up your spring course at edtechnologyspecialist.com to learn more from you, or maybe to share with their colleagues who need some credits yes, uh, and some, some learning for engagement for students in the classroom. Thank you so much for being with us today, Jamie. Jake, it was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it was a blast. I'm glad we were able to work this out. Me too, for sure. Okay, you have a great one. All right, you too, Jake. Thanks. Ah, fantastic stuff from Jamie. She's a blast and a great educator and lots of great content there. So now let's hear some stuff from the duct tapers out there. First up, our Apple podcast review of the day uh, comes from back in January. It was from RB Ohio. Rich said, Jake Miller's podcast is just what I need to infuse new ideas to challenges in the classroom. I love that his guests include new names to me as well as others who I also follow on Twitter. Each week, I look forward to the new episodes. Keep them coming. Thanks at our booth 1024. Rich, thank you for sharing this and for your kind words. I, I'm, I appreciate you listening and I definitely, definitely appreciate the review. For those of you who haven't left a review, it does help others find, discover, and uh, try out the podcast. So I really do appreciate that. Next up, some hashtag EDU tweets from the duct tapers out there. I got a whole lot today because there were a lot that I enjoyed. It was hard to narrow it down. First up, at a Nicola 21 Andrew said, at Jake Miller Tech, looking forward to, and he has the high five emoji and the fist bump emoji, at ISTE 2019, hashtag EDU duct tape. Uh, I will be at ISTE 2019. So those duct tapers out there, I can't wait to see you there and give you those high fives and fist bumps. If you're going to be there, let me know. I'd love to hear about who I'm going to get to meet that, that are in the duct taper community. Next up, at Trey VZ. Trey said, finally getting around to listening to at Jake Miller Tech's hashtag EDU duct tape podcast, and I'm annoyed with myself for waiting so long. The ideas are rolling out like a conveyor belt. Guys, people that are just now hopping on board with the duct tapers are getting overwhelmed by all the ideas from the 13 episodes so far. So you've got to find your friends and get them to start listening now before they get further behind. So go tell everyone you know, listen to EDU duct tape. Jake's guests are amazing and have lots of great stuff to share. You got to check it out. Next at Mr. D's Ing. ENG class with three S's. My buddy Les on Twitter said to the hashtag Q19 crowd, the Q conference was just about a week ago, said, go meet Matt Miller at hashtag Q19. At Carly Mora says to go tackle him from at Jake Miller Tech, hashtag EDU duct tape episode. Uh, so there was a, Matt had posted a picture of himself at the conference and Les remembering back to Carly's story in her episode about tackling Matt when she first met him. Uh, made a little joke on that. So that gave me, that gave me a, a giggle there. Next up at Julie Gard, G-A-R-D 300. Julie said, go take a listen to my new favorite podcast, Educational Duct Tape. It fully supports our philosophy of tech is a tool to help solve a problem. At Jake Miller Tech, can I get a sticker to add to my laptop so I could spread the hashtag EDU duct tape message? So Julie's tweet was the one who sparked my idea of including at the beginning of this episode about how you can get stickers for yourself. So Julie, thank you for doing that. And hopefully Julie will have her own stickers to start spreading that message soon. Next up, at Sean J. Fahey, a guest from back in episode six, said, I'm more and more impressed every day with the awesome things that at Jake Miller Tech does. He's, was, so as I was reading this the first time, I was feeling super flattered by this, but then I got silly at the end. He's an awesome educator, hashtag EDU gift creator, hashtag EDU duct tape podcast host, and now a pop music singer songwriter. And he showed his uh, in-car stereo with the, uh, the title of the song that was playing on his radio up, and it was Jake Miller, the pop artist. If you guys aren't familiar with Jake Miller, the pop artist, you should go check him out. Actually, no, I don't really like his stuff, but it's not me, unfortunately. I'd be really rich and probably not recording this podcast if I was that Jake Miller. Um, I'm, I'm the um, less less wealthy, less good looking, older Jake Miller who talks about education. <laughs> but that was a good one, Sean. Next up at Engaged Edu, Crystal, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know if it's Crystal or Crystal. At that moment when you were driving home from hashtag Q19, listening to your new fave at Jake Miller Tech, hashtag EDU duct tape, and your tweet gets mentioned on the podcast. Uh, Crystal, thanks for uh, sending this back to me because it, it does take me quite a bit of time to get all these tweets ready to read and then actually read them and then list the new tweeters. So it's nice hearing people say like they appreciated it and they enjoyed hearing their name on here because you know, it's a little reward for me for spending the time doing that. Next up, speaking of a reward, at Mrs. Kids Count, Laura, this one, I, I got to be honest, when I 
first saw this one made me tear up a little bit said words cannot explain the impact at jake miller tech and his soapbox in episode three of hashtag edu duct tape had on me this quote has been stuck in my head all day thanks to sarah Kiefer and at ross rams learn which was me one of their district hashtags there i'm now a dedicated listener hashtag inspiring educators laura thanks so much for this uh, and she showed the picture of the maya angelou quote that we talked about back in episode three if you haven't heard my my take on that um that quote, please go back there. And Laura, thank you so much for tweeting this. It made my day to hear uh, how much that affected you and how it's impacting you in your classroom. Next up, at Jay Chanter 22 who we just heard in this episode right after she finished recording with me, said, I hopped right on the Gamer Networks after our show. Loved being on the show and can't wait to hear it. So she showed a picture of herself wearing her son's gamer headphones that she used while recording this show. Pretty hysterical picture, Jamie. Next up, at Allison E-T-E-C. Allison said, just browsing through the hashtag ISD19 sessions and noticed hashtag EDU duct tape as a premium session on Saturday. Check. See you then at Jake Miller Tech. I hope I'm going to see a bunch of duct tapers at that session. So again, as I mentioned, I'll be there at ISTE, and I hope to see a bunch of you there. Next, at AK Tech Teacher, Alexandria said, feeling like I have accomplished true nerd ed tech status. I'm in the middle of a renowned, renowned or renowned? I never know what to say. Mystery podcast, but two mornings in a row, I just thought I'd rather listen to hashtag EDU duct tape. Loving all the tips from at Jake Miller Tech and can't wait for GIF a day. And she also shared that the Carly Mora episode was her favorite. Alexandria, thanks for this. I love that feeling of... Uh, having something, I, I don't know, like special that you could listen to, but then going like, you know what? I'd really rather listen to whatever. And her saying hashtag edu duct tape was a thing she'd rather listen to. That, it's, it's an honor. <laughs> so I appreciate that, Alexandria. Thanks for sharing that. Next, at Dana Clement said, also may have binged all episodes of at Jake Miller tech hashtag edu duct tape. And now I am best friends with Jake Miller. Hashtag duct taper, hashtag besties. Thanks, Dana. I got a kick out of this one. This one got an LOL out of me when I read it. Our final one for the day at VRW Jones, Jenna or Gina or I think it's, I'm guessing it's Jenna. I don't know. Let me know. Said, just made a screencast five video at the gym. A teacher friend Snapchatted me a question about power tests, and I just happened to have my laptop with me. We will rock you. Might have been playing in the background. Only a true duct taper, Jenna, would record a screencast while at the gym. <laughs> Next up, our new hashtag EDU duct tape tweeters of the day. We've got at Cindy WMS5, at Don Head Compute. C O M P U T at K R E N W R E N 18 at Lives L I V S Rodriguez with an S on the end at Noah's Arc Tech at Tama Trotti T A M A T R O T T I at T R Griffin 1 at Whiteboard Techie. And finally, our Flipgrid submission for the day comes from our friend. Angela Green. Before I jump into hers, I do want to say I'm, I'm running out of videos to share, guys. You got to hop onto that grid, flipgrid.com slash edu duct tape, or go to edu duct tape.com and then click on the Flipgrid link so that you could record some audio to be included on the show. So let's hear what Angela has to say. Hi, Jake. Um, at Angela Green 12 in New Carlisle, Ohio. And of course, Roger is with me. Um, I just finished episode seven and I was really excited that you mentioned Tim Kite's R Factor. And I'm looking forward to how you scaffold that class that you were having trouble with and control your R to get a better O. We're actually trying to roll out the R Factor disciplines with our entire district. And I'm in the process of putting a Google site together for our community and our students and our teachers. Um, I was very grateful to Carly Mora for introducing us to csnsf.org, although I was typing the letter in instead of I in. So I found the show notes and was able to get the right resource. Also, a couple podcasts ago, whoever mentioned InShot Video, wow, so much fun. And um, I wanted to ask a question about Adobe Spark Video. Is that a 13 and older resource? Because that's all I can see, all I can find is that it's for 13 and older. Are people using that for 13 and under? So I wasn't sure about that. Um, also, I wanted to tell you that the split screen extension on Chrome is pretty cool. That's going to be my little tip is the split screen extension will allow you to do two things in your screen at once, which kind of mirrors how the state test looks for most kids. Okay, keep on doing the podcast because it's awesome. Thanks. Bye. 
Wow, Angela, you packed a lot of information into there. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks for listening. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed my talk about E plus R equals O uh, in some of the earlier episodes and the talk about that student pay STEM course. For those of you that haven't heard those, you got to go back and hear about that course and, and the different things I tried out and the different growth that I found in myself as I went through it and kept analyzing and reflecting on what was happening in my class. At that time, I didn't know E plus R equals O, but I was really utilizing it back then. And I love the E plus R equals O theory. Uh, I love hearing about how your district is moving forward using some of Tim Kite's resources and message with students. I bet that's going to be great stuff. Uh, The CSNSF program that Carly Mora shared about great stuff. That was back in episode seven. I'm glad I put it in the show notes so you could find it. Uh, InShot video I actually had never heard of, so I think you heard it on a different podcast, Angela, but I went and Googled it and it does look awesome, so now I'm going to try it out. And I agree with the usefulness of the the split screen extension. And finally, the Adobe Spark thing. This does seem to be an issue in a lot of different schools where they're having problems with age restrictions. So I looked on Adobe Spark for education's website website and look through their guide and it says that the ios app is for 12 plus so that's one issue and they said account creation is for 13 year olds and over however it says that students under the age of 13 can have accounts that are created and administered by teachers or parents and it says it's intended for kids k through 12 so it is intended for all age levels however there are some protection issues for students under the age of 13 which i think makes sense and is totally fair it unfortunately does add some hoop to jump through but hey it's still there it still works and i think it creates great tools i was using it just the other day adobe spark is pretty awesome well that does it for today thank you again for listening make sure you're subscribed if you're not already make sure you're downloading and listening make sure you're sharing with your friends and thank you for being with us and being a duct taper have a awesome day bye Thank you for listening to the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. Please visit eduducttape.com to join the discussion, share possible topics, inquire about being a guest, or contact Jake. And remember, duct is spelled with a T, not a quack quack cake.